Here. Commissioner Romano. Here. And Commissioner Walker has requested and excused the absence. Here. Commissioner Romano. Yeah, so it seems like the feedback's coming in from maybe the mic being too close to the speaker. Yeah, so it's saying like the feedback's coming in from maybe the mic. Yeah, so it seems like the feedback's coming in from maybe. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Thank you, sorry about that. Oh, you. Oh, yeah. Very good, very, very, very good. Please follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand, take play. Follow me, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, according to Secretary, please describe ways the public can assess this other meeting virtually. This meeting is being live streamed from the city of Penn and a portal www.penn-amazon.com forward slash public forward slash portal. If anyone would like to provide a public comment, they need to do so in person or on the city of Santa Ana portal. The opportunity to speak is going to follow the next comment. If a member of the public wishes to speak, Please select the Zoom hand icon to let us know you're present and you would like to speak. You will be called upon by the name you entered. If any members of the public are present at this in person meeting, please be sure you have completed a speaker card or contacted me and then hand me the speaker card, or I will be happy to give it to you if you need one if you're going to speak. You will have three minutes to speak. We will alert you when your time is up. Madam Secretary, do you have any uh, one wishing to speak? There is no one wishing to speak. Okay, then we're going to move on to the set of calendar items one and two. Please note these are the minutes for the September 13th ETEC meeting. We're going to check if we have any commissioners' absence to be reflected as excused. Chair Jermaine, after an excused absence. Commissioner McLaughlin, after an excused absence. And Commissioner Walker, after an excused absence. So there were three requests for an excused absence. Yeah, and we have one that has not asked for an excused absence. Yes. That is correct. Is there a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar items one and two? A uh, motion by the uh, Commissioner Romero. Do we have a second out there? 
second. Second? Okay. Is that Commissioner Rohrabacher or is it coming out? That's coming in. Thank you. Please identify yourself. Thank you. Corey Secretary, please, please take roll. Vote. Commissioner Lomando made the motion to approve the consent calendar items one and two, and Commissioner Escamilla has seconded the motion. Chair Jermaine is absent. We're going to take a vote. Vice Chair Manager. Aye. Commissioner Escamilla. Aye. Commissioner Rohrabacher. Aye. Commissioner Romano. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you. Okay, moving on to business calendar, item number three, tree removal and replacement at 409 and 509 East Fourth Street. Uh, this item will require a vote. Yes, I would like to introduce Dave Bayer, our principal engineer, engineer in planning and development, to uh, he has a small presentation for us. Commissioner Dow, uh, can you see the screen? The ETAC item number three, please confirm. Commissioner Escamilla and Laura Walker, can one of you confirm you can see the screen? Uh, confirmed. I can confirm. Uh, can you repeat that, please? Confirmed. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the Commission. I'm Kay Gagan, Public Works Agency. Um, the, the item before you tonight or t this afternoon is the uh, removal uh, of trees, removal and placement of some trees at 409 and, and 509 East 4th Street. It's associated with a, a new development on two city blocks. Um, mixed use, 15,000 square feet of commercial space and 169 residential units. Um, the applicant has proposed to remove five trees in total. Actually, one of them has already been removed by city staff. Um, to mitigate the losses of the trees that are in good condition, staff re recommends applicants, recommends or will re recommend the removal and the applicant to pay for the tree recovery value. Um, uh, this slide here shows uh, at, at least where the trees are. The, the trees shown in red are the trees to be removed. Trees shown in green are uh, trees that will remain on, on the two blocks. Um, and the, uh, the trees that are uh, the, the trees shown in red are removed? Oh, I'm sorry. And, the, and then there are some additional trees that the applicant will be planting, 29 in total. So of the five that were originally requested to be removed, um, city staff, the uh, tree street supervisor, um, went out and valued, evaluated trees and placed valuation on the tree. There is there is one tree, uh, number five. Uh, it's on the left side of the screen um, that is in good condition and it's uh, a good specimen tree. Unfortunately, it conflicts with the, uh, with the uh, proposed driveway of the site. Um, the other trees are either in poor condition or of, of lesser value, as shown on the little table below. Um, the tree number eight 
which is on um, Mortimer Street, uh, west side of Mortimer Street, um, is uh, it has a clearance problem. I'll, I'll show you in the photos. The other, as I say, are, are either poor, smaller, or um, have actually been removed already. The, the tree on the left in the view is the one uh, that I said is in, in good condition. Unfortunately, it conflicts with the driveway location. Um, the uh, the uh, holly oak tree in the middle of the screen, the, um, the, the difficulty there is that vertical clearance. And the um, street tree supervisor has indicated that would be a tree that would typically be removed by city staff. Um, the, the next one, I'm sorry I got out of order, the next one is actually number 13. That is in what he deems good condition. There is some value to that tree, but it's obviously lesser than the other. That's a, a valuation of, of $700. The next two trees, um, um, the, the tree on the left would be a tree that staff would, our, our public works maintenance staff would deem that tree in such poor condition that it would be, it, it should be removed. And and the tree on the right, the uh, what's called tree ID number 15 on Minter Street, that has actually already been removed by the city. Um, so the, the approval by staff is to uh, approve the um, the recommendation by staff is to approve the, the removals of those trees um, with the um, with the mitigation costs that I mentioned earlier. Um, it, around uh, $5,590. Um, as, I, as I said earlier, the, the development will be installing or replacing 29 trees, so there will be plenty of trees around the two blocks of the tree of uh, the block. Um, that's that's all I have for my presentation. I'm here to answer questions. Commissioner Romero. Uh, Commissioner Romero, here. I'm curious where the 29 trees, what the distance of those will, will be um, after they're planted and the amount of the, the distance between the trees, the standard distance that we have on street trees is, is typically about 35 feet. Uh, it, it can go 35 to say 45 thereabouts. Uh, it's just placed to, to um, avoid driveways, um, uh, street lights, um, fire hydrants and, and those kind of things, power poles, whatever. Um, uh, in this view, if you look on the screen, um, I'll, I'll, I will try to um, to identify where those trees would be. That, uh, if you can see the cursor, that is a new tree. That's a new tree. That's a new tree. That's a new tree. That's a new tree. Um, this is an existing tree to remain. And that, that is pretty typical, that kind of spacing. Um, and then on the width, I'm not sure that there are many, obviously many um, uh, street alignments there, street sections, but typically the minimum width that we have from curb to property line is 10 feet. And so, so typically what we have with that is a five foot wide parkway and a, and a five foot wide sidewalk. So that's, that's the most common uh, the most common alignment for the sidewalk and parkway. Yeah, I have a, I have a question. Um, is there any way we could transplant uh, the trees into new existing into new positions instead of cutting one down and planting new ones. They didn't look super tall. I uh, I can I can answer that best I know how. I, I think we have uh, there has been discussion about that. 
certain uh, big rooting trees are very difficult to remove and relocate. Um, there, there is one tree that's very small, the, the, the one that's a valuation of $700. That potentially we could relocate. I think the, the developer has indicated that if that one is a problem for ETAC, um, he, he would be fine leaving that in place because his intention was just to take that out, put in a new tree, uh, whatever the uh, street tree, designated street tree is for the area, he can do that. But the, the one I think that is of particular value, the, the very big one that conflicts with the driveway on French Street, I think w I, I would estimate would be very, very difficult to, to cut in, uh, cut the roots, uh, uproot and relocate and, and have it survive. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner Eric <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, no, totally understand the uh, tree needing to be removed for a driveway. I would just, I guess, uh, look to planning to see if we can move those driveways in the while we review. But I know it's a little too late for that. Um, I, I guess my, my bigger concern right now is just um, whether or not there are any nesting birds in any of these. I, I imagine during the winter, we're not going to have as much of a problem, but I would ask that uh, city staff uh, does ensure that there are no nesting birds uh, when they are removed, so it might actually be better to remove them faster rather than later in case the uh, spring comes and then we have uh, additional birds that we're going to be uh, moving out, out of the way. So that's all I got. Thank you for that, Commissioner. Thank you. This is Commissioner Ben Hedger. Uh, question, switch on T3 number 11 and ID 12. Are we seeing something there in the pruning that we have all those sprouts coming up when the roots in the trees? Should we have those to cut back? So, Commissioner Benninger, you were talking about number tree number uh, tree number tree number eleven and tree number twelve. Identify the eleven and twelve. Okay, I think number eleven will stay in place. But that's going to be turned back there to the base, right? Yes, more than likely it would be trimmed back. So number number twelve um, number number twelve. The proposal was to remove. Number 12. Correct. My question was, are we missing something in tree trimming or maintenance that we allow sprouts like that to come up from the system roots? I, yeah, I, I would defer that to the tree department. And then a quick question also. It looks like the sidewalk and out of the picture 12, tree 12, looks like it's both kind of a part of the to repair the sidewalks around the facility. Yes, yes. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Commissioner. Uh, in regards to your question about the, um, it was the commonly known as the circuit growth. Um, Can you please uh, identify yourself? Oh, yes. Uh, my name is Arturo Rodriguez with the City of Santa Public Works Maintenance Services. In regards to your question about the sprouting at the base of the tree, um, that is uh, a common occurrence, but that's also one of the signs that contributes to the poor condition of the tree. So um, typically, again, that is addressed during its normal uh, trimming cycle and, and as needed uh, between trimming cycles. So what on these trees, what would, would be a typical trimming cycle? Uh, for the oak trees, it's every four years. Hmm. Thank you. Okay, if there's any other questions, I think we're ready to, uh, to vote. I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, Commissioner Romero, I'm curious what an alternative is if, if it's not approved to remove the tree on Frank Street. I think it's tree number five. Um, uh, Commissioner, thanks for the question. There, there isn't any alternative on that one. Um, I realize it's, uh, it's a, a little bit tricky, but if the if the tree conflicts with a, um, an approved site plan, um, the, the staff has the ability to uh, remo uh, approve the removal of that tree. 
Um, the reason why we're coming to you tonight with the request for approval was actually specifically for number 12, for, for tree number 12. Um, the, uh, the intent, and, and that's by the, the way the city code is written, the intention there is um, the uh, site plan layout, site plan layout is the purview of planning and the planning commission. And so, um, so again, if, it, if it's related to the function of the site, um, the, the uh, development engineer, the, the city staff has the ability to approve that. Any other questions? If not, can I have a motion and a second? Motion to approve, Commissioner Rohrbacher. Uh, you second? I, uh, I will second that. Recording Secretary Keith to call the call vote. Vice Chair Manager. Aye. I'm sorry, I need to um, repeat you. the motion. Commissioner Warbacher has made a motion to approve staff's recommended action to approve the tree removal and replacement at 409 and 509 East 4th Street. And Commissioner Manager has seconded the motion. Uh, Vice Chair Manager has uh, voted yes. Commissioner Antonio, what is your vote? Yes. Commissioner Warbacher? Yes. Commissioner Romano? One quick question. Um, either way, if, either way, the city would remove it, right, because it's poor quality, so we're voting on it, but... Oh, in the long run, it will be removed anyway because it's poor quality. Number 12, tree number 12. I'm sorry, let me, let me go to my sheet. It is, I'm sorry, it's number 13 is the one. And let me. Um, I had 12 earlier, but they're both poor quality. Poor quality. Uh, number 13 we had is as good. It's uh, it's subjective and it's very it's very close. But number 13 is the one that is at issue. Okay, I vote yes to the move. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to the next item, uh, the stormwater program. Just a reminder to ETAC, we need to adjourn the meeting before 5 to 15, before 5 to 15, to do a council meeting right after the ETAC meeting. Um, do you want to go ahead and and we have three, 30 minutes before five, so that's why I proceed. Good evening, everybody. My name is Craig Foster. I'm with the uh, Public Works Agency, and I manage the city's NPDS program, uh, also known as the Stormwater Program. And I was invited here to discuss, um, to give an overview of the city's stormwater program and discuss some cool stuff we've got going on with um, stormwater capture and treatment. Okay, so I'll go over a brief introduction of uh, kind of stormwater and regulations and the NPDS program. Um, and then we'll dive into the city's NPDS program and discuss the major components, um, the municipal activities, public education, uh, new development, redevelopment, construction, existing development, illegal discharges, water quality monitoring and sampling, and then we'll highlight some stormwater capture and treatment projects that we have going on right now. And this is a picture of um, 
of the, the uh, Santa Ana del Aire flood control channel, and this is Upper Newport Bay down here. Uh, I'm too, sorry, I had to interrupt. I'm not getting the uh, change in the screen, so I'm still seeing the other um, PowerPoint. Cool, thank you. So that's better. Great. All right. So the first major question we want to ask ourselves is stormwater. Where where does it go? Um, there's two two main systems that the city has. You know, one is the sewer system, and one is the uh, storm drain system. So it's important to know that these systems are not combined; they're separate. Um, so when it rains, stormwater flows into what we call catch basins here. I'm sure you've seen these, you know, within the sidewalk and the uh, curb and gutter. And then it flows through a network of pipes and flood control channels and eventually flows straight out to the ocean. And stormwater is untreated. So that's a very important uh, aspect and basically the reason why we have a stormwater program to try and maintain water quality standards. Um, and then on the left, we have the sewer system, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, you know, your sinks, your toilets, laundry machine. Um, that all flows to a, the sewer system and to a centralized sewer treatment plant. Um, in our case, it would be the Orange County Sanitation District on Fountain Valley, and that's where the uh, sewage is treated before it's discharged. So very important distinction there, you know, sewage is treated, stormwater is not, um, and so stormwater can, you know, carry various pollutants out to the bay, to the ocean, and you know, the city, city takes a pretty proactive approach in trying uh, reducing water pollution and protecting water quality. So some brief regulatory history. Um, the NCDS program was actually established as part of the Federal Clean Water Act in 1972. And then in 1978 through 1983, the uh, EPA conducted a series of studies where they actually found that stormwater runoff um, had similar characteristics and pollutant loading as runoff from industrial, you know, facilities. So, can contain pretty, pretty highly polluted water. Um, so that kind of spurred the uh, amendments to the uh, Clean Water Act in 1987, where municipal NPDES permitting was incorporated. So the first permit issued um, by the Santa Ana Regional Water Board uh, in 1990, and we are currently on the fourth term permit here. It's since 2009. And a fifth term permit is scheduled to be adopted. Um, they said in spring 2023, but it keeps getting pushed back. So I'm assuming sometime still in 2023, but there's no exact date yet. So our, you know, our NPDES permit is issued by the uh, Santa Ana Regional Water Board, um, as I stated. So it contains various programs and activities that the city has to do to comply with the program or with the permit. Um, so one of the major components of our, our uh, NCDS program is uh, municipal programs. So we inspect our own municipal facilities to identify any potential sources of stormwater pollution um, and implement BMPs or best management practices, kind of a broad term to basically describe, you know, a, a, a practice that facilitates reducing stormwater pollution. So some examples of that would be, you know, cleaning the oil things at the city's municipal yard. Um, install sediment control BMPs around stockpiles so when it rains, you know, the stockpile doesn't shed off and flow out to the uh, street. Covering any rusty materials to, you know, stop any metals from leaching off in the stormwater runoff. We also have a pretty uh, comprehensive catch basin cleaning and inspection program. Um, we are required by our permit to clean 80% of our drainage facilities uh, annually. Uh, we have about 1,600 catch basins, and this is a catch basin here, um, and 1,275 of them have been retrofitted with the connector pipe screen units. So these are basically trash capture devices, um, and they trash, capture trash down to the five millimeter level. So we have won, I believe, five or six uh, grants from the Orange County Transportation Authority to install these CPS units. So we have them about in about 80, I think it's about 85% of our catch basins. So we're capturing a significant amount of trash and debris um, before it goes out to our storm rain system to the receiving water. And I believe last year we removed uh, about 58 tons of materials from our catch basins. So another component of our permit is public education. Um, public education is definitely a key tool in reducing stormwater pollution. You know, going back to that first slide, 
that I mentioned. Um, most people, or maybe not most, but a lot of people don't know that the sewer system is separate from the stormwater system. So, you know, we always like to advocate that and, and alert the public of that, you know, main component of the program, and that really opens their eyes into how, you know, their behavior can impact, um, you know, water pollution. So, public education is definitely one of the best, we call it source control BMPs for, you know, stopping pollution at the source by educating people. Um, and we do this through various, you know, mechanisms. We have our intercoastal cleanup day. Um, we do some social media blasts. We do presentations, you know, similar to the presentation I'm giving right now. Um, and we also put uh, articles out in our Stan and Green newsletter. So that's what I have on the right here. Um, this is an article we, we do, kind of similar article every couple of months, every uh, couple issues. And this is um, from our countywide stormwater program. It's a pretty cool graphic showing all these various pollutants that can be discharged in uh, stormwater runoff and out to the ocean. Here's a photo from our intercoastal cleanup day. This was actually a few months ago in September. Um, one of the uh, members of the church that attended had a drone. So got a pretty cool photo here. We, you know, we conducted a cleanup of this flow control channel from McFadden Avenue all the way up to Monte Vista Avenue. Um, I think it's about a thousand linear feet or so. So that was, a, that was a great event. The next aspect of our program, new development, redevelopment, um, basically, this is a really big component of the program, and um, it requires certain developments that create 10,000 square feet of impervious surface, or what we call significant redevelopments that add or replace 5,000 square feet of impervious surface. Um, and by that, I mean uh, hardscape, concrete, roofs, asphalt. Um, and they're required to prepare what's called a water quality management plan. So a water quality management plan, or WQMP, consists of a project description, um, a watershed description where the project is located, pollutants of concern from, of the run, in the runoff from that proposed project, and then various BMPs, the source control BMPs, and then the treatment control BMPs, which are actually the, um, you know, the physical system that's going to be installed to capture and treat the runoff from that site once uh, construction is complete. And then there's also a, uh, a plan, a site plan, and a maintenance plan. So staff is required to inspect these BMPs as they're constructed. Um, and then we're also required to conduct annual um, operations and maintenance inspections once construction is complete of the BMP system. So there's various BMP types. Uh, one main type, the preferred type, is infiltration BMP um, or infiltration BMP. Um, basically, projects must infiltrate the stormwater runoff unless they can't for some reason um, due to shallow groundwater, maybe poor soils, or they're in a groundwater protection area. Um, these have water quality benefits, right? We're removing the pollutants from flowing out to the receiving waters, but also water supply benefits where, you know, the water is percolating back down into the local groundwater table where it can be used, you know, down in the future as a, uh, as a water source. Um, so here's a picture. This is a, um, a new car wash that went in, and this is what we call a bioretention basin with no underdrain. So you can see the, the gaps in the curves so the stormwater runoff flows through here and it flows across the surface and percolates through a special uh, engineered soil layer and then down through the gravel layer into the native soil. Another type of infiltration BMP is subsurface infiltration. Um, these BMPs are pretty cool because you don't see them, which means you can maintain a usable space on your site. Um, for example, this is what we call storm chamber system at a parking lot at a hotel. So this is right here. So you never know it's there. You still maintain your parking area and the runoff infiltrates, you know, flows into all these chambers and infiltrates back down into the native soil. Same thing over here, just a slightly different system. There's little perforations in this pipe and there's perforations in these chambers as well. Pervious pavement is another infiltration BMP. We have pervious concrete and pervious pavers. Um, so this is concrete that has a lot of gravel in it, so the water it provides pore space for the water to filter through and then infiltrate. And then the stormwater runoff of the pervious paver filters through these void spaces in between each paver. These have a pretty cool look to them as well. So that was infiltration, biotreatment BMP. This is a secondary BMP type. Um, as I said, if you can't infiltrate, then you can move to biotreatment. This is basically when stormwater is treated and then discharged to the storm drain system. So this is a bioretention basin with an underdrain, the same as the first system that I uh, described, but it has a perforated PVC pipe. So the water basically filters through the soil and the gravel into the PVC pipe, and then it's discharged out to our system. 
Uh, this is another uh, biotreatment BMP system. It's called proprietary biotreatment. It's basically a precast concrete unit. There's multiple manufacturers of these. You kind of just you know drop them in, and they come with uh, special media and that perforated underdrain as well, and the runoff filters through this and out through the perforated pipe and into the uh, adjacent strong drain right here. These are pretty convenient to get space constraints, or um, they can be slightly cheaper as well. Harvest and reuse BMPs, this is the last uh, type here. These are not very common because they require a lot of space, and not many sites um, have enough demand for the water. If you have a very large development, you have to show that you have an irrigation demand for that, all of that stormwater, because you don't want the water to sit for too long. So these systems are pretty rare, um, but they are an option. Another aspect of the program is construction site inspection. Um, essentially, we're required to inspect all construction sites within our jurisdiction to make sure that there's no pollutants being discharged to the storm drain system when it's raining. There's low, medium, and high priority inspection. Um, this is based or high priority sites. This is based off of the site's location within our watershed. The city's located in three watersheds. There's Newport Bay, Santa Ana River, and uh, Anaheim Bay. So essentially, when it rains on this part of the city, all the runoff flows to Newport Bay. When it rains in the middle part of the city, all the runoff flows to Santa Ana River. And when it rains in the western part of the city, all the runoff flows out to Newport Bay, or sorry, Anaheim Bay, Huntington Harbor. Kind of outside of both cheaper. Um, so yeah, each, each site is inspected based on its priority. Um, and last year we did 487 inspections. And the primary pollutant from construction sites is actually sediment. So sediment can make the water cloudy, it can you know, prohibit um, photosynthesis and visibility in the water. So it's very, uh, can be very damaging to the uh, food chain. So some stuff we like to see on construction sites, traffic control BMPs. Um, so the trucks aren't trapping mud up to the street, sediment controls, uh, you know, using a concrete washout, covering stockpiles before rain events, and here's another example of uh, sediment controls as well, still sent here. Another program of our NPDES permit, existing development. Um, this is basically consists of inspection of all the industrial and commercial facilities within our jurisdiction. So this is a very large program. Um, we have a consultant help us with this program. And the facilities, again, are prioritized high, medium, and low based on you know, the activities and what type of um, industry they're in and also their, any history of violations. Um, and last year, we did 917 inspections. So here's some examples of things we don't like to see at industrial facilities. Um, you know, metal, metal recycling, metal uh, shavings are definitely a big source of, of pollution. So, um, and this is better, you know, material handling, keeping stuff out of the flow path of stormwater and storing it in 55 gallon drums. So it's a pretty comprehensive inspection program. Illegal discharges, um, we're required to respond to and prohibit uh, certain non-stormwater discharges from entering our storm drain system. And we do enforce the water quality ordinance and issue violations and administrative citations for those violations. Um, that's uh, chapter 18 of our um, municipal code is the water pollution ordinance. And last year we responded to 84 incidents. And here's a couple of examples. Um, you know, somebody just decided to dump some antifreeze in the gutter here and some oil over here, and here is a uh, the sanitary sewer overflow. So generally, we are notified, we issue enforcement if there's a responsible party, um, and we supervise cleanup as well. The NPS program also is responsible for um, the removal of household hazardous waste that is illegally dumped in the public right-of-way. Um, this is unfortunately a pretty common practice in the city, so oil, paint, batteries, um, you name it, people tend to just leave it where they feel like it. So last year we responded to um, 335 requests and we removed 8.7 tons of illegally dumped material from the public right away. That's a pretty, uh, pretty big program as well. So if this wasn't removed, it could potentially spill and you know, become a much larger issue. And the last program is water quality monitoring. Um, we're pretty collaborative with the, with the County of Orange. They're what we call the principal permittee on the NPDES permit. So they conduct most of the monitoring. And you know the monitoring provides pretty useful information. You can calculate pollutant loading. Um, you can get a concentration of pollutants you know, multiplied by a volume of runoff when you have a pollutant mass. 
Um, it helps us identify prohibited discharges and then assess, assess the health of receiving water. So here's uh, what we call an outfall. This is where the city storm drain discharges into the Orange County Flow Control District channel. Generally, the county um, of Orange does own all of the large flow control channels, and the city owns all the pipes that connect to those channels. And this is me uh, taking a, a sample of one of our construction sites a couple of years ago. All right, so that's kind of an overview of the NCDS program. So very brief. I'm happy to um, you know answer any questions or respond to you know, further inquiries on our program, but. I also wanted to highlight some cool stuff that we have going on with some stormwater capture and treatment projects. Um, you know, we, over the past several years, we've kind of shifted our focus in the public works agency to de stormwater as a resource. Um, this is especially important in, in California with the drought and it's consistent with um, the California water supply strategy. So our agency is actively seeking grant funding to implement these stormwater capture and treatment projects. Um, they have multiple benefits. They can improve water quality, increase water supply, reduce flooding, provide educational and aesthetic benefits to the community, reduce urban heat island effects and address climate change, and also can be um, some good public education components to the project as well with interpreted signage. So I want to go over a few projects we have going on right now. Uh, the first one is Raven Myrtle Park. This one is currently under construction. It's a new 1.18 acre park and it features a underground uh, subsurface, subsurface stormwater infiltration system and two biotensions with an undergrant, with no undergrain, excuse me, so they're infiltration BMPs. Um, and they're designed to capture uh, runoff from the total drainage area of approximately 10 acres. So we, have a, we had a new park planned at um, the intersection, so instead of just capturing the runoff from the park itself, we decided to make a regional stormwater infiltration system. So the whole neighborhood essentially flows into the park for infiltration. Um, we're hoping to capture approximately 5.3 acre feet per year. And this grant is from Proposition 1, the IRWM program, it's, uh, issued by the Department of Water Resources. Here's some construction photos. This is our subsurface system. This is me, so you can tell the scale here. It's a very large underground system. And this is actually going to be located underneath the skate park. So again, we're taking that you know, idea of maintaining our usable space, but still providing that benefit to the environment. And here's the biotension basin with an underground. This is just a gravel layer. So on top of this, you, you get the engineering soil, you get the mulch, the landscaping, um, a lot of urban greening with these systems as well with the drought tolerant planting. So these provide multiple benefits too. Next project is a downtown flood reduction and stormwater infiltration project. Um, this project, we just received construction bids. This project takes a two-pronged approach of reducing flooding by upgrading the existing infrastructure and then also installing another subsurface infiltration system underneath a city-owned parking lot at 3rd and Bush Street. Um, these BMPs are designed to capture a runoff from a 19-acre drainage area and approximately 8 acre feet per year of stormwater capture. And this grant will come from Proposition 68 uh, from the California Natural Resources Agency. That's $3.9 million. Here's some flooding at 3rd and Bush Street. This is kind of what spurred uh, the need for this project. And here's our uh, contractor doing some testing for stormwater percolation. Here's the site plan. So essentially the runoff flows through this storm drain and gets diverted underneath this parking lot. There's a pre-treatment system, a storage system, and then some dry walls to infiltrate the runoff. The San Ana Zoo project, uh, this one we have conceptual design complete and it features another subsurface infiltration system, um, a new urban green space, which is consistent with the zoo's master plan. So basically removing part of the parking lot on the western part of the zoo and replacing with a new green space, kind of a pocket park, I believe it's about um, 0.35 acres. And these BMPs, this is a very large project, are designed to infiltrate runoff from a 180 acre drainage area. Um, so we're at approximately 67 acre feet per year of stormwater capture. This is a $2.6 million grant from Proposition 1, again, same grant as Raven Myrtle Park. So we, we're two for two on this grant. Um, and Caltrain is the project partner on this project, and they will be contributing $1.25 million. Because part of the drainage area is the uh, five freeway. So this is the area where the the parking will be removed and we'll have the urban green space and we'll actually be reinstalling some pervious parking and some more pervious parking and um, uh, more infiltration system over here. So two systems, one on the west 
and then one in the overflow area. This is a schematic of the main infiltration system in the west, where there's the, you know, the bio swale, the trees, there's the pervious parking areas. Um, the runoff flows down Main Street right here and gets diverted underneath um, for infiltration. And there will be a pedestrian pathway kind of connecting uh, Elk Lane to as well. Main Street Urban Green. Uh, this one, we're currently signing the grant agreement with Caltrans. Um, this is a pretty small project, but it's still a great project. There's an unused kind of public space at the intersection of King Street and 10th Street. I believe it was an old street that got abandoned. Um, so we'll be adding a new urban green space there. Um, and then also, in, you know, some interpretive signage, some art and decorative installations, and fire retention and infiltration system as well. So this one's about three acre feet per year from a 10 acre drainage area and about a one and a half million dollar grant from Caltrans. So this, this project is really not even meant for stormwater capture, but this is a great example of, of how we utilized a grant that was more geared for the legal dumping and public space cleanup to you know, achieve those goals, but also implement a stormwater capture project. So this is a pretty innovative project. Here's a photo of the, of the space. I'm not sure if you've been by here before, but you know, definitely not much going on. Um, there tends to be illegal dumping and trash you know, dropped off here. So we're basically going to rip out all this asphalt and create a 10,000 square foot kind of new urban green space with the stormwater capture features. And here's the runoff you can see during the storm going south down here. So all this runoff will be captured in our beam feeds here. Here's a concept plan. There'll be a bicycle pathway also kind of connecting this neighborhood to the north on King Street with our Tisha Pilar neighborhood um, down to Faraday Street here and the future of the streetcar, which is you know, down by Faraday and Civic Center. Um, and then here's the schematic of the underground infiltration system. Bristol Tolliver Urban Green Project. I believe this is the last one. Um, this one, we're still in the application phase. Um, we're in step two of three. This one infiltration is not feasible due to shallow groundwater, but we are proposing to use a bioretention basin and then also a harvest and reuse system. So we'll capture the runoff and actually reuse it for drought tolerant um, landscape irrigation. Um, this one has a small five acre drainage area and about 1.27 acre feet per year of stormwater capture. And we are seeking three and a half million dollars from the California Natural Resources Agency. And again, this is another example of us being creative and utilizing a grant towards, you know, urban greening um, to implement a stormwater treatment project. This is the site. This is a vacant city on parcels, Bristol and Tolliver Street there, the southwest corner. So this is 1.25 acres altogether. So all this will be transformed into kind of a new park with recreational features, um, uh, turf area, signage, tons of landscaping, boulders, it's going, to be, it's going to be really great if we get some money. And here is our site plan. So a fire retention basin down in the south here with the turf area and the harvest and reuse system underneath there and the recreational features as I mentioned, the play area, half basketball court, skate park, uh, pedestrian pathways, tons of shade trees. The last thing is the Stormwater Project Master Plan. This is kind of a planning document um, that we are developing with a consultant to basically expedite the project development process. Um, so we're doing a kind of a multi-layer analysis to identify these potential sites. Um, and there's a whole scoring criteria that we developed where basically all these parcels are screened. And if they, you know, if they hit on all these criteria and score high, they kind of float to the top as a um, preferred location for a future stormwater plant. So we're currently in the early stages of development of that plan, and the goal is to finish it in summer of 2023. So when we have a future grant opportunity um, coming down the pipe, you know, from the state, we could, you know, flip open our project master plan and say hey, this project goes great with this grant opportunity. We already have uh, basically a concept developed, and it'll um, further increase our chances of funding. So. I believe that is all I have. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank, uh, thank you, Greg. I've got a little bit of questions just because of the purpose of time. But uh, Commissioner Romero, do you have a question? Commissioner Romero, thanks for the presentation. Um, no direct questions, but I am interested in um, knowing where I could find the locations of these projects, the urban greening projects. I think that's great. To, add on to the city, especially 
areas that aren't being really used for anything other than dumping. So I'm curious where I could possibly find the locations you shared tonight. Yeah, I'll give you my card and you can send me an email. I'm happy to provide all the uh, contact oh. lines. Yeah. Commissioner or Do you have any questions? No questions. It looks like a really good use of uh, wasted space. Commissioner, I'm sorry, I keep calling. They just have to say Danny. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, was that, was that for me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, no, just uh, two uh, uh, quick things. Um, uh, number one, just on the stormwater management plan, I didn't see a, any prioritization for existing flooding of residential or commercial properties. So uh, I do want that to be included as one of the criteria. So I know that on the 1900 uh, south block of Cedar, so essentially Cedar and St. Andrews, uh, there's reports of consistent flooding um, for lack of kind of stormwater, um, it, it, a lack, lack of a stormwater infrastructure in that location. So I would like to see that prioritized. Uh, if we do know of any areas like the third and um, Bush Street area that do get flooded uh, when we have rain events, so I would include that as a criteria. Um, and then second, if you could, uh, as a staffer, just communicate um, uh, support for programs that turn the uh, existing flood channels into um, pedestrian or bicycle or other kind of recreational linkages. I think that they would make a really great system. Uh, so very much supportive of efforts uh, to, at least, I guess, very similar to the one that's there by Jerome Park, as far as creating additional um, public rights of way uh, for non-motorized modes of transportation within the city. Uh, that's all I got. Hey, uh, thank you, it's Commissioner Benninger. I guess my question is on these large, in the, I live in the southern part of the city, we have some major redevelopments taking place in that area. Mm -hmm. Are all these new developments required to do any, any viable work? Yes, so if, um, if they are creating 10,000 square feet or more for the impervious surface, they are required to have a water quality management plan. Or if it's an existing development and they're doing a redevelopment, if they add or replace 5,000 square feet of impervious surface, they are required to do a water quality management plan. So that consists of essentially capturing and treating the 85th percentile storm event on site, which is about three quarters of an inch. Okay. Because a lot of these are uh, long existing shopping areas that are going to be ripped down and mm -hmm. built uh, high rise apartments on. And so they would qualify? On Bristol? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Good to see. This is a great quote. This is a great program. It's a great way of recovering rainwater to let just rush out to the ocean. So I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, moving on to staff. Is there any questions from staff? Any uh, comments? Thank you. Uh, no questions. No comments. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Commissioner uh, Input, uh, Commissioner Romero, comments? Um, no comments. Commissioner Orlock, any questions? No comments? No questions or comments. Thank you. Mr. Asimilia? No, no questions or comments. Thank you. You guys are really very just to be. Well, first of all, happy birthday to the bell. Many more to come. I also want to thank the staff members here for all the good work and that we've heard. There will be changes as the new uh, uh, council members take position in the new mayor's place. I want to thank all the commissioners that I've worked with, but uh, I appreciate the input and the comments uh, on it. Uh, this is a fun group, and I think it will be listening to us. Put your name in and let us see. Uh, for the council, no air students for every game commission. It's a very green time, and I really end up enjoying the time that we have here. This. So, with that, we hope that uh, Commissioner Germain gets well quickly, and we'll see him at the next week. Thank you. We're now adjourned at 502. Alrighty. Bye, everyone. Well, by the way, very good to see everybody, and happy new year. See you next year.